Excellent. Well, on my end, I'm also now live for anyone tuning in. Thanks for being here. Shane's about to present Taking Back the Sky, the map of the celestial of celestial observations. And it should be a banger. Thanks, everyone, for coming to this Take Back the Sky event. This will be part two. We're going to clinch it, I think, today. We're going to have everything we need to own the sky and not be afraid of the sky as an argument. We'll, in fact, be able to dominate the sky as an argument. So today's uh, presentation slash video is going to be about three parts, right? Three kind of big parts. We're going to first go over the math that we derived in a spreadsheet format to denote elevation angles to Polaris all the way through zero to 90 degrees from Polaris to the equator. We're going to go over the relationships between that data. We're going to extrapolate a little bit. Then we're going to also go over the optic derivation of the supposed radius, 3959. Uh, so instead of having a physical Earth curve, we're going to prove mathematically that it is nothing but an optical curve at the same rate, denoting the limit of our spherical vision. So we're going to take that for part two. And for part three, we're going to go ahead and model everything that we're talking about on the all new uh, dome model where we're going to be able to see the personal celestial sphere in action and exactly mimic and emulate everything that we need to do. So let's start by addressing the problem, right? The problem that they think or the problem as they see it. They say that the angles to Polaris on a flat earth approximately corresponds to the latitude. That's, you know, incorrect. Of course, when they say that the longitude wasn't invented until 1725, then I guess they must have known it a long time before then since they navigated pretty well on their own. Anyway, they say this fact has observed every location on Earth where Polaris is visible. I would agree that apparent rate would definitely appear to be different, right? They're saying that it doesn't change. No, it definitely changes. They have the same angle. They just put it over 90 degrees. So when they say tracing the path from multiple locations, it does not point to a consistent position of Polaris. The reason is that Earth is a sphere and the flat Earth model does not represent reality. Well, that's frankly retarded. So. What happens is they don't know how far it is either, right? To Polaris, actually, in, phys in, in the physical world, it's beyond light speed and nonsense and a whole sense of uh, galaxies away. So they push it to near infinity, mathematically, right? For no reason and say, oh, we solved it. They don't have an actual distance. Mind you, every star in the sky to them is a different distance, but they'll treat them all the same when they want to navigate celestially by them, the same as we would have to, right? So when when we have to say we, we treat it the same, all the stars have the same distance and we treat them as a static field that rotates, they have to do the exact same thing. But first, let's focus right over here where it says at the equator, this lovely little lad right here at zero degrees can see Polaris. We'll challenge that in a little bit and we'll use that as the basis for the test of our new, probably more accurate and better method to do this, right? So that that is their argument. And if we want to get down to where we're going to come at it from, right, they're saying so everything in the world you know mountains trees tall buildings they recede into the distance proportionate to distance due to perspective right but everything else everything else everything else in the world proceeds into the horizon proportionate to distance due to perspective however the stars recede into the horizon proportionate to distance for a completely different reason called curvature Right, so again, boats into the horizon, perspective. Trees, perspective. Mountains, perspective. Tall buildings, perspective. You would a field, perspective. Anything that does the same thing, perspective. But the stars, curve, curvature. Got it. Okay, so that's that's where we start, right? We're going to aim to prove that that's nonsense, and actually it recedes into the distance proportionate with the same proportionality as everything else. So let's get started, and let's first give credit to Gleam, who did this earlier, but did it uh, linearly using Euclidean geometry, of course, and he used this wonderful formula from a wonderful paper, getting an actual distance judgment. I think it's from 1958 or something. Wonderfully getting uh, you know, this wonderful formula, the Galinsky 1951 equation, essentially. And it's used, well, still staying well within Euclidean geometry and linear functions, it's fantastically accurate, I think. Anyway, credit to Gleam for starting it. Here's his wonderful macro when he graphed all of his linear functions showing elevation angles to Polaris at each latitude. This is indeed what it's based on, but we did it slightly differently than Gleam. He went indeed linearly, and we're going to go non-linearly. He did an excellent job on what he did, absolutely, but we're going to take it a little bit further. So just to outline what we're going to talk about here, essentially, right? We're going to outline mathematical elevation angles to Polaris, approximate distance and height, call it the GP using a basic trig function and a little help from a unit circles. So 
we're going to use the ele elevation angles apparently and we're going to derive the distance and we're going to walk that all the way from polaris at zero all the way to the equator so these are the terminology we're going to use we have an angle to be the elevation of angle to polaris decreases as one moves away or equivalently as one moves southward on a flat earth so Again, we're going to compare it to globe Earth, and they say that that's the rate at which Earth curves when you walk away from Polaris. And again, keeping in mind that mountains, trees, uh, street lights, anything tall, buildings in the distance, all receded that rate due to perspective. But the stars, again, due to curvature, when these radians, uh, which is just the angle converted into radians, it's for usually it's required in Excel and, and for trigonometry. Hypotenuse in this case would be the radius of Earth. That's not what we're going to use it for. We're going to use it for the optical equivalent, which would be the radius of the limit of our visual grid, and or in other words, the length of our azimuthal grid of observability. And again, we're going to derive that optically using the Rayleigh criterion and angular resolution limit, and also the rate at which something appears to drop at six foot height over three miles. We'll get to that in just a bit. But for now, no, that has nothing to do with the globe. That's what's going to govern our limit of vision and height. This is going to be the vertical distance from the surface to Polaris. Many misunderstand this concept and insist this would be constant, but in my table, it changes, which nicely approximates the effect which incorrectly attributed to the globe model's curvature, right? And this is the supposed curvature because they attributed this one effect and everything else to perspective. So we use that sine function to obtain that in some of the data, which we'll get to in just a moment. Again, the length, which would be the length of the triangle, we use it for the cosine and we represents a distance to the ground position of the star so that's our variables this is how we're going to get there we're going to use kinematic equivalence to describe a different way to get the math description for the same parent relationship to elevation angle and distance we're going to say that it's linear for a portion and nonlinear for another portion we're going to derive that from relationship specific to the data after we graph it out we essentially replace what globe earth argues is curvature by correlation right we're going to use elevation angles to polaris with specific positions we're going to approximate the altitude and get the length and that will approximate what they call earth curve but in reality will mathematically prove as you move laterally x 69.07 miles this personal celestial sphere above you will rotate correspondingly either up one degree or down one degree depending on if you're going to or from it so again essentially this is just a clever way to also describe the relationship you guys had claimed exclusivity for and appropriately reappropriate that for us right so now we can once again use the absolute observable facts of reality which you for some reason thought were exclusive to the globe model so we use this to explain us essentially this right this is where we're coming from uh, as you move 69.07 statute miles laterally this personal celestial sphere moves up above you we'll demonstrate that quite nicely in a little bit but for right now it's a good representation you know if it goes left it goes this way if you go right it goes this way if you just kind of stand here this is what it would look like these are the angles say you could use for celestial navigation and again it's nothing to do with a physical sphere it's just a limit of your visual space the actual image here i took is from stellarium which is you know from you guys area of the neck of woods and it's just the stereographic view of a azimuthal grid so wonderfully nice way to use your model to show you what i'm talking about and we'll go down a little bit you know the angles that we can use for celestial navigation like i said and again this is all built on the concept of limit of vision right so if we see the same distance in all directions if we take a stick that's 39 59 miles and we sort of swing it all the way around us that will give us the radius of our spherical limit of vision right and you do convert it to degrees and radians you get about point 0217 right that's the Rayleigh criterion right so we can use optical limits of the Rayleigh criterion and the perceived drop over a short distance of a six foot observer and we can use these two things to backwards derive the radius of earth right it's very simple here's a, a, exactly how we're going to preface it again this is all is available on the uh published database under the optics angular resolution or earth curve section it goes a little bit more in depth there's a lot here but just to briefly cover how this isn't, you know, taking the physical radius of Earth as well, we derived that there is no physical radius of Earth. There is only optical curvature through the bottom of an optics or a lens or an aperture or an eye. And this is how that works. So we're just going to say if the ground is brought to your eye level, right? The person disappears from perspective, vanishing bottom first. And that's addressed by here. This wonderful image it just says because the bottom is so much closer than the top, 
That's why things disappear bottom up. That determines the limit or your horizon. The better question to understand this is why don't they disappear top up, right? Obviously, because the bottom is much closer. This is why that happens. So we have an angular resolution limit approaching distance, scaling dynamically with how far away you go. And again, this would describe why the bottom is first. This is describing the limit of your resolvability. And this is sort of putting it all together to determine how they got the radius. So this is just an extrapolation of the above with the perceived drop rate of six feet over three miles. And it's essentially extrapolating that out. It just converts it to decimal 0.666 feet. These occultists love their numbers, as they say. And so they're going to do, essentially, this is what it comes down to. This right here. So they get, they get the radius of Earth as a distance divided by the tangent of the theta angle, which is what we derived earlier. So we get the angle, essentially, by doing this, right? We've already obtained the rate of the criterion. We've already determined this rate of drop at six feet. We now just assume that this portion represents an arc of the edge of our spherical limit of vision. And boom, we can do some basic trig to get this radius. So we just say, hey, if I determine that that edge of my horizon is actually an arc of the limit of my spherical limit of view, then I can do the tangent and get, oh, I can get, well, if I observe a height over this part, then I can get actually the tangent and put it over the rate of the criterion, 12 feet over three miles equals radius 39.59. Very, very simple. So it's, if this is the limit of our spherical view, then we can derive that backwards that way. And again, do we say it's a coincidence? Of course not, right? The people we use do all sorts of things, not by accident. Uh, let's just say that they're occultists. They have, you know, an assumption with numbers and they do love to trick us, right? So if we say, believe things that aren't true through this, they would love that. But rather than teach us the physics of optics, they specifically did not teach us this. And they told us that we could see forever and that distance and light scale infinitely. You guys see how important this was in the beginning? This is why they had to have us believe that because this is how important it is. But essentially all they did was backwards derive the way optics works and then told you that the earth actually curves at that rate physically all around you. Again, think about if you have a viewing radius of 39.59 around you, all they've done is told you, okay, as far as you can see, it's flat, but just beyond where you can see, for every piece of land beyond you, it's actually perpetually curving down where you just can't see it or feel it. That's how they got the globe to work, guys. They said every bit of land you can't see is curving downwards away from you, and that's what they got us to believe. And this is how they did it, because they knew optically that would that would check out. If you backwards derive the math, it's down to the hundredth of a degree accurate, okay? This is the exact radius of Earth. Go look it up. Exact radius determined this way. So would it be a coincidence that we can determine the radius down to the 10th decimal? Or is it actually backwards derived from optics? You guys can decide. Check out the database. We'll go forward with the celestial sphere argument now. Just to explain the uh, unit circle here, right? So this is because the radius is one. We can directly measure sine, cosine, and tangent. We set it to 3959 and then multiplied it by that afterwards, our result, so that we know we were using it correctly. And again, this dictates that we set the maximum and vis visible radius around the observer, which we move with you, as 39.59, right? And we could have approximated it like this. We would just use this, just think about this math. This is what our math is doing when we're moving from the Polaris to the equator. We're approximating it. This is a grouping of 10 latitudes at a time to show you the difference. But essentially, we're doing this all the way through at every step of the way. Uh, so essentially, we're going to say that it's non-linear, right? It's maybe could be parabolic, exponential, linear, logarithmic, depending on the distance and the portion that you're analyzing. So we derived a kinematic equivalence between the proportionate relationship between distance and the amount of things in the sky appear to recede into the horizon. We use the unit circle and basic trigonometry to demonstrate this relationship. Right? The height of each created triangle is determined by the sine of the angle and radians. The length of each created triangle is determined by the cosine of the angle and radians. The hypotenuse slash tangent is that 39.59 visible spherical limit of your radius. And this maintains proportionality but uses a method that cannot be claimed exclusive to the globe. The few globers who I brought this to before presenting it, I had asked at the end of the presentation, at the end of the argument, can you now claim that 69 miles per degree is exclusive? And they both answered with a non-no yes answer, right? So they just went off into nonsense to try and claim some other things. But again, here's the data. Here's how we derived it, right? It's just basic all the way through. 
So again, we see the same distance in all directions. This is a representation of a, a yardstick extending out 39.59. And again, just to the celestial heaven, obviously not below you. It's really just a hemisphere. And again, it's from front and back and it's you know extending in all directions. So that's just what we're gonna be using it for. So here exactly is what I was talking about. Here's how we use the unit circle in the data. We just essentially set that set of one to 39.59 and proceeded to use the sine and the cosine all the way through to get our data. So keeping that in mind, here's how we got all the data. Next, we'll go through the relationships. Just to sort of run through this one really quickly, right? We do 69 miles per degree. We get, uh, let's see, 69 miles per degree times 90 degrees of latitude will give us 6210 miles. So we get 6,210 statute miles between Polaris and the equator. Now, why isn't that the radius of Earth, you might think? Well, wonderfully, that's the linear distance, right? So when we have a spherical 3D object, we would take that linear distance, that would be shrunk, technically, you know, quote, shrunk, to fit the curved arc, which would be the radius of the sphere. And what that is, the curved arc of the radius straightened out as a linear distance. That's how they get around it. So even though 6210 is not 3959, 6210, in a curved arc would be 3959 and 3959 straightened out would be 6210. So that's how they're going to go about that. And that's how they explain the relationship. So if we have a spherical limit to our curved visual space that has a radius of 3959, we don't have to worry about that linear distance that exceeds that because of the basic geometry of a sphere. <clears throat> that radius would only see that distance in every direction. Okay. That already utilizes the linear relationship of the sphere. It is no longer linear. It's in 3D physical space. Everyone clear? We got some visuals to go over, but don't mind the stick art. Of course, we made this in Canva. So again, a observer, say on the earth with a spherical hemisphere radius of, let's say the circumference would be 24,800 miles. That's, that's describing this whole, you know, visible arc. And again, this is applying only to the celestial heavens and the objects therein. So stars, things like that, not visible things on the horizon or boats over the horizon or anything. That's a very different expression. And again, we derived our spherical radius through that expression. So again, this is just saying we have a 39 pigment invisible radius, and that's how we perceive everything around us. So if everything's up here, here's how we see it as we go along. And that's perfectly emulated by the personal celestial sphere. So again, just another example of what we're talking about here. And here's the visual to try and visual to try to understand what a linear uh, a linear relationship is to, to when it's translated into a curved arc, right? So 6,218 is exactly what it would equal. That's the linear distance. And that says equivalent to a 3959 geodesic arc, right? So if we sort of take this linear distance and we turned it into this 3D sphere up here, then that would turn into about this radius here, 3959. It's tough to visualize. Probably could have done a better job. But, you know, if you need need better understanding probably ask a better global right this is how they uh, explain that that linear relationship so we're just going to take the same relationship because again we're describing the limit of our visual space exactly the same way because we derived it through the limit of angular resolution combined with the optical drop rate of a usual observer so we'll keep that we're going to move right along before we go look at the graphs we drew from the relationships between the data let's look at one of the results from the optics reading from Ether Cosmology the other day when they had done the other experiments and this was a non-Euclidean experiment for you know doing depth perception in real space and again what they had concluded was that there was an angular excess in present in vision part of the visual field which they used this triangle to represent and they said that the optical space is elliptic, which is curved in the near zone, but hyperbolic in the far zone. So they're concluding that this distortion is optically induced and also described by different geometry than Euclidean. So this is sort of the premise for what we do for our uh, predictions when we get down to the math later. What we can do with this observation is more accurately predict distances, more accurately do celestial navigation, more accurately describe, you know, distances at the horizon where they're compressed into not infinity, but approaching the limit, but never reaching it, right? Approaching the limit of your visual space, but never reaching it. So we just graphed a couple of things, apparent angle to apparent height. That one looks like it approaches infinity, but not really. Here one, we have, you know, a couple of different distances. We have uh, drawn a trend line and 
you know, uh, created a function. Again, same thing here. This is kind of approaching the 6,000 mile because that would be the linear distance to Polaris. All right, so we'll spend a little bit of time here just going over some of the data graphs, which were meant to represent sort of the relationships between the data in the columns, right? So we have apparent angle to apparent height, which would be sort of logarithmic, uh, logarithmic like that it doesn't approach zero, but it approaches the limit of vision instead. It never reaches it. Same, same sort of graph, same sort of relationship. What we're really gonna focus on though is this one right here, right? This one is the big one, right? This is essentially just apparent angle to apparent height. So this is the optics function. This is what it would appear apparently to your eye if no other considerations were made. And this is the one that I think that would best describe sort of how they have celestial navigation currently operating, right? It's a logarithmic function. Again, logarithmic like doesn't approach zero, but approaches the limit of vision instead, never reaches it. It's the linear portion is exactly where the table of corrections for celestial navigation begin. Uh, they, dis they disavow accuracy below that amount and above that threshold. So I'm going to conclude and assert that this is how they trick people, right? They use what they knew was not linear of, of this optic expression of scaling, and then they restricted the use of it to just the linear portion. So in this way, they convinced the public that distance scaled linearly infinitely, right? So they said, look, see, you could take this measurement, you can look at this tree, you can take this measurement, you can see how, how far away, okay. But that only works for a certain portion of your vision. If you try to do it on the horizon when it's compressed into you know in, into nothing, then that would be a lot more difficult, almost impossible, you might say, right? If you're at the equator and you can see Polaris say just about on the horizon, if you do a linear function to tell me where that is and how far away it is, you get just about that linear maximum, the 6,200 miles. But if you go further than that. That linear function describing that distance fails to operate, right? On the instances where it's below the equator, where they can see, they say they see it one degree below the equator, they see it from the south, they see Polaris. In that case, they have to invoke refraction because the linear function they would use breaks down entirely, meaning it's not at all linear at that degree, right? Same thing when you're trying to uh, especially navigate, right? If we just use Essentially, let's look at th this picture here, right? If we're going to say that you have a uh, celestial dome of vision, that a personal celestial dome that moves with you, then you could say that you could denote angles all across there from 180, right? Essentially, essentially would be this this right here. You can denote angles all the way across. That would be 180. So let's just say that they marked <laughs> this march right here as you can't use it because below here they have quote refraction, and then this much right here. You can't use beyond that because of reasons. So essentially they're limiting you to right here, which just happens to be the exact linear portion of this logarithmic like expression, right? So you see why it's important that they have to make you believe that distance scales infinitely, I presume, because otherwise you wouldn't believe in light speed and distant galaxies and the cosmos and all those things that they have to build upon distance scaling linearly infinitely. Now, if that wasn't the case, would you believe in all of those things if you knew that the math wouldn't apply at certain threshold and only applies during this linear portion of the logarithmic like function? Well, I don't know. We're going to find that out today. And so essentially, if they restrict you to this portion, then you would never know that what you're doing is not a linear function, right? If they only let you use the linear portion, how would you ever know? Essentially, we're discovering that the distance function isn't linear, shouldn't be linear, has never been linear, and the best way to describe it is with this non-linear logarithmic-like expression. So that's what we're going to conclude. And again, this is all updated on my database for anyone to peruse. I did update it last night with some actual intention and some words and direction. So it says, you know, this describes what happens at the extremes of your vision, at each horizon, for example, right? The relationship of Polaris elevation angle is not linear at the horizon. We went through this with a couple of the Globers, right? And they, I think Zanuck immediately admitted that, yes, that linear function wouldn't work. At that point, Ruhef immediately admitted that. However, our logarithmic-like expression would perfectly describe that thing being no more, no more resolvable through angular resolution. So it's beyond the angular resolution threshold limit and is thus beyond that uh, curve, like, approaching the limit, but never quite reaching it. So that's the correct graph to illustrate exactly what we see in reality. And this part's just going to be tailored to those who object to the use of an apparent position of a star. 
right? Of course we use the apparent position. Everyone uses the apparent position. The real position, quote, for heliocentrists is light years and light years away and they're all at different points, right? They're all different distances. When they navigate by them, they must pretend they're all the same distance and rotate around the observer. Oops. And here's a little example from NASA they used to put up on the NASA website. It's on the archive, right? And then when they, they were trying to describe how the moon would work in, in relation to perspective, they invoked something very similar. They said maybe it's the shape of the sky. Humans perceive the sky as a flattened dome, the zenith nearby and the horizon far away. It makes sense. Birds flying overhead are closer than birds on the horizon. When the moon is near the horizon, your brain, being trained by watching birds, miscalculates the moon's true distance and size. Essentially, this is NASA explaining the same sort of phenomenon as we do. We're going to go into now what the personal celestial sphere would do and how that would work and how it works with the math that we described. And then we can sort of put the whole thing together and explain how the sky works on flat Earth in reality for everyone. Now we're going to go over what is the celestial sphere and how we're going to use it as the personal celestial sphere. Right? So here's a nice uh, little video that we're going to watch in a little bit. But let's start with this, right? The celestial sphere as a whole is something that they use to envelop the Earth. Yeah, and then has it uh, a radius that is infinite because those uh, star distances have no, you know, they have no real numbers. They just push them out to infinity. And then here's how you would calculate, you know, everything based on the celestial sphere. And again, this is going to be important because this is how you would do everything globe earthers, right? This is how everything works for you. You wouldn't be able to calculate anything without it. There's a whole bunch of backup on the other side here if you want to go through it. But again, flat plane, person in the middle observer at you know have a zenith and you have a degree you have an azimuthal grid of vision as we keep saying and saying and saying and saying right so here we go this is just different examples of the meridian the zenith overhead how a star would circle again when it's below the horizon it just pretends that it circles below your feet and the timing would work out again it's not below your feet it's just circling away and out of your vision across the earth Right, but the, the effect is exactly the same. At the latitude, you'd see exactly this. You'd see stars rotating around you equidistantly with both poles visible on each side. And we're going to go into it showing exactly that on the model that we made. And again, at the North Pole, this is what it would look like with the ground position of Polaris right, uh, right above you. Here's what it would look like with the basic right ascension and declination when they're trying to calculate things. So if that's below the horizon, here's how they calculate it. Again, Celestial coordinates are just right ascension and declination, same thing as longitude and latitude. If you've been following along, that would be equal to celestial coordinates projected onto a map system. <laughs> the celestial sphere is the sphere. In case anyone hasn't put it together yet, the celestial sphere is Earth anyway. Let's go through just a couple other examples before we go into how we're going to use the celestial sphere, right? So again, this is how they take degrees. This is how they do right angle and declination. Very similar, we're going to see to how we would calculate things, right? And they're going to say we can't use the celestial sphere, but of course we can. Everybody does. It's how everything is calculated. Now, again, this is just a video showing you how it would work. It's all the way through, all the way through the, the flat plane, which I'll have, you know, <laughs> added here for visual effect. Now, again, this would move with the observer, and it is about the radius of 3959. So it's about the radius of Earth, but just describing the spherical limit of your vision. And again, this will go on for a little bit, but it's exactly what we mean when we talk about the celestial sphere. So it's essentially just a person looking up, right? He sees constellations. They seem to be processing around him. Again, the stars process both with time and with movement, as we proved mathematically. 69.07 miles laterally will force it to process one degree. But here's a nice illustration of the celestial sphere surrounding the observer and how it just moves with time. And again, we're going to exactly emulate this shortly. So that's another good example. And then here's just some more some more math. I'm going to go to the back to the top and we're going to go to the emulator that we referenced here. So here's astronomy education at the University of Nebraska Lincoln and this is a wonderful tool that we're going to use real quick to just demonstrate some basic principles about the celestial sphere in action okay so make sure we can see everything all right here we go we're going to make some choices so we're going to put us anywhere on the observer notice that when we move this map location changes and this declination changes so this person is always on a flat plane 
and above him is always this half sphere, right? Which is emulated by the full celestial sphere around him. So we're gonna have star patterns. We're gonna put all these things here. I'm gonna add some stars all the way across. Here we go. And we're gonna add star trails and we're gonna do all these things. So essentially anywhere we go, right? If we add motion, all of a sudden, it pretends the earth is spinning, which just emulates the movement of the stars around us. Then this little stick figure over here gets some star trails and some action of things rising and setting on his horizon. So this is exactly what we see and how we how we use uh, the stars to navigate, how we see them, how we can use them to determine where they're going to be, how we mapped out the sky. This is a direct product of all the ex elevated geodesic surveying and mapping of the sky with the latitude longitude people. This is what they were able to achieve. OK, the star map, the wonderful one to one map of the celestial sphere pushed to the celestial rather the earth bound geoid, right? earth as a geoid if you just replace this map with any other map right it would do exactly the same thing wouldn't be a globe and everything would work together now if you're paying attention right all maps are the same as i kept saying so therefore we could put any map here right any map and then we'll walk this person along and then we can see what the stars look like at every latitude right because the only thing that really matters is latitude dependency we figured that out right so if we move this guy to say Australia, oh look, that's the South Pole moving around, you see? That's how it would illustrate it. And if we go up to the north, here we go. We see what you would expect to see in the north. There's his North Pole. There's the stars emulating around him. Here's the celestial equator. So I just wanted to point out, you know, that this is something that the celestial sphere is something that everyone uses. It can't be exclusive to you guys. And when we use it, again, much, much better. Uh, then you should just accept it, right? Because we're using the same tools as you. This is just a flat plane anywhere on Earth emulated by a personal celestial sphere. All right, so let's move on. And since we're driving at home, let's drive at home with a hammer. Here's Stellarium using the same sort of viewing mode. It's just called the orthographic view, which wraps the observer in a personal celestial sphere and then emulates the stars around them. As we see here, the star is moving. Let's go a little bit faster. And again, this is a southward person. You can tell because the north say Polaris isn't visible, right? It's below the horizon, technically. Of course, it's really not. If we look at, you know, <laughs> this view, right? Everything is just a personal celestial sphere. They're just hiding half of it with the ground in the atmosphere. Fair enough. We'll turn it. Here's our wonderful South Pole, our optic convergence south of the equator that's latitude dependent. And there we go. We can move that around anywhere on that latitude, and it won't really do much. If we change latitude, that's when the declination changes of that optical convergence. Here we are at the equator, where we have a perfect view of both poles optically converging on the side, right? And again, here's just a personal celestial sphere where our observer is obviously right here. If he looks this way, he sees just about that cresting on the horizon, looks this way, he sees just about that pole cresting on the horizon. Let's go north a little bit, where we can see where most of the people in the world see. Again, 88 to 90% of the world's population lives in the Northern Hemisphere, and this is what they would see you know, circling around Polaris with all the different constellations. And again, personal celestial sphere. Couldn't emulate it any better than Stellarium. It's the exact same model that we're going to employ, right? And it's just this easy, guys. This is what we use. This is what we say. I say that we're going to use to, on a flat Earth, we have a personal celestial sphere. The only difference is I'm just giving this a parameter and a, a an actual distance, right i'm just saying that celestially speaking on the sky this represents a half sphere of radius 39.59 that's the only leap we're taking I'm not inventing the personal celestial sphere i'm not saying that you know, this is only applying to us i'm just saying hey we've decided that this represents a maximum viewing distance and globers think that oh no you can see forever everyone sees all of these stars just not correct all right so now we're going to go into a quick little video that I put out earlier that's just going to quickly address the celestial sphere with, with some music and some animations. I wanted to take a look at this wonderful tool for all the globers who are laughing at the personal celestial sphere or the personal azimuthal grid of observability or the azimuthal grid of vision. For all the people who don't understand that concept, because honestly, the people who laugh are the ones who don't understand, right? Let's look at how you actually use the celestial sphere and how it is used to portray everything in the sky 
literally without the personal celestial sphere, you wouldn't be able to identify any object, any declination, any time, etc. So they do use a globe here, like, ooh, you guys got me. It's a globe, right? So we, we, they're demonstrating on a map on Earth, and they're showing you over here in the regular Mercator where you can choose and manipulate, showing you the, of course, very well-known longitude and latitude system that we are so wonderfully com comfortable with and familiar with. And then we'll just put it over here. We'll show all this stuff, I think, because why not? We'll add some stars and we'll show some star trails, right? And then we'll just make sure we have all the constellations. So we would pick a location and this would, of course, move and scale variantly exactly as Walter Bislin's personal azimuthal grid would, right? Scaling with, what is it? Latitude, everything is latitude dependent. And when we look, say, over here, and then this would show us what stars would do, right? So, if, of course, on the left, we're imitating Earth spin, which, of course, is the globular inverted perception of the stars rotating above flat Earth. No big deal. We're all comfortable with our perspectives and our positions here. So they pick a spot, and then this small little uh, dome here imitates what you would see for the stars. This is the only way to emulate stars. This is the only way we can envision stars, right? So personal azimuthal grid, personal celestial sphere, whatever you want to call it, when you laugh and say that everyone has one of these, that is literally how it works. That is how observer-based grids work. In Stellarium, you have the azimuthal grid, which is observer-based, has to be personalized and that's the only way you can compare azimuth, right? Otherwise, you'd have no idea where you'd tell a friend uh, on the other side of the world where, where a star would, would appear. Everyone should be aware of what the model is that you use before you want to laugh at the model that's going to replace it. That's better. Thanks. All right, and so for the final part here, just to put it all together, just to roll it all into one, just to get the best sort of visualization, understanding of how the personal celestial sphere works utilizes lateral movement to you know move and show you stars and process and all those things let's go to the, our newly developed flat earth model which of course will be the flat earth dome model uh we see here we have exactly what we're talking about so a personal observer based celestial sphere that follows the observer this would emulate uh, something that is 39.59 across right so this is not the scale still working on portraying that to scale Let's get rid of this and all of these wonderful things. And we'll just look at the stars, right? So we have stars that process. So if this observer, say, moves, right, then that would force these stars to process laterally, right? So, so you see how this is moving? You see how this little grid moves with him, right? That's moving up 90. So if that's, if that's 69 miles, that's one degree, one degree, one degree, one degree one degree all the way around until we see the stars processing. The same thing would happen also if the time were to process, you see? Time were to process, stars process over the observer. As stars process over the observer, they appear to rise and set on your horizon. Again, due to that limit of your vision, you will not see things that extend past that limit, right? You're only able to see things in a radius of 3959. And this model would explain stars perfectly with a perfect, with a personal celestial sphere. So real quick, we'll run through it. Underneath Polaris, as we saw with the other diagram, right, it's directly underneath. This is the ground position. You see stars process like this, perfectly around you. Everyone processes perfectly. If we take this observer, we move him, say, halfway to the equator. Let's push him out, say, 45 degrees. Let's put about right here. And now we can see that his stars are tilted at a 45 degree angle just like the celestial sphere model from the education of astronomy was showing us, right? And then we process and we see exactly that what we would intend, right? This processes equally. He's got 45 degrees towards the horizon. That's where he sees the focal point. That's where the, that's how the stars work, just like that. So let's take it a little bit further. Let's move him to the equator, push him out to about right here. And then now we see that both of those things have popped up on the horizon so we have the north pole just about visible we have the optic convergence known as the south pole just about visible right here and if we process the, the stars here we see they're you know rising and setting over this observer's personal celestial sphere as they process over the earth so he's seeing this as two poles and again the equivalent would have been on the celestial sphere model Right, so just so we can have both in vision here. So again, this is what we're emulating with the personal celestial sphere. Here's the global mainstream way to do this. And here's how we emulate it exactly. Now, 
what we're going to claim ultimately, of course, is that this was backwards derived from us to be made exclusive to the globe, but we're not quite there yet. So again, this will process like this. This person is seeing exactly what we would expect on this personal celestial sphere model. And again, if we move this observer to any location emulated by this, we could emulate the exact same thing it looks like. So here's the celestial sphere under the equator. Here's our personal celestial sphere under the equator. Boy, it looks a lot alike, doesn't it, guys? I would say it looks identical. Here's what we have with the zenith on the 45 degrees, what we just emulated. Let's push him back out there. And oh my God, guys, if it, I didn't know any better, right? I'd say this was the exact model they would use to map the sky. Oh, look at the personal celestial sphere exactly emulating this. Hmm. The solstice, you say. Well, wouldn't that work with the sun? Didn't we do that with the sun tracker as well? Let's just go ahead and put that back on. We have the sun track. Where's our sun? As the sun rises. Oh, look, there it is. As the sunrise comes, it rises and sets. So, again, emulates this exactly. And if we go through these positions, you can see that there is no configuration that we cannot emulate. This works perfectly to emulate all star positions, emulations for every right ascension and declination for every observer all over Earth. Let that sink in, guys. If we can't model it, right, then we got a problem. If I can model every observation from every observer on Earth using this, I'm not sure what your refutation will be, to be honest. Uh, that about wraps it up, I think, for the total cumulative presentation. It's a lot to take in. I expect we'll have a lot of questions after this to go through, but mostly, Again, we've redefined some math based on the angular resolution limit to take back the so-called radius and define the limit of our spherical view. That was the basis for the determination of how this, how big this personal celestial sphere should be. Okay, and we've also presented the personal celestial sphere as a model to emulate the math. And again, the math putting forth being the backbone of what we're arguing here, saying essentially, we don't need a linear relationship to have this. We've derived a nonlinear relationship. Here's the supporting math. Cannot be denied, cannot be dismissed. So now we own that, right? We have at least equal claim to the 69 miles per degree relationship, which is all we ever needed in the first place. Let's be honest, right? The whole point of this was to reclaim what was already ours. <laughs> and then we've used the math to, pr to produce this wonderful model that will emulate exactly what we see and how we want to, to see the stars, right? And again, we have the model available for everyone to use. Should you have, an, have a debate, you can always go through the model. Uh, it does have a lot of descriptions on the bottom for how it will be used. As it says here, the purpose of this model is to show the geometric and physical aspects make perfect sense in reality. Mathematically, the personal celestial sphere moves over the observer one degree as they process 67.07 miles across the horizontal axis. That is the crux of it. That is everything. That has been mathematically proven, as, even though we've derived it, and that is why this works. That is the backbone of everything. So that pretty much does it. Thanks, everyone, for uh, tuning in, and uh, we'll see you next time. Awesome presentation, bro. And I think a really important relationship to, uh, to kind of harp on is how you derived the 3959, you know, not using any of the globe things, right? Not using the radius of the globe, just all from our optics. Yeah. And the Rayleigh criteria, dude, that is a fascinating relationship <laughs> that it, you can derive the radius of Earth down to the, what was it, eight decimal point? Yeah, eight decimal point. <laughs> What's it pointed that out, dude? That's, it's, it's, do you think it's a coincidence it's to the eighth decimal point or bro, is it derived from optics? To the eighth, bro. Good game. Like, there's no, it need literally, to be like, there's no room for the argument. There's literally no room yeah. for any other model. Yeah. And just for, just for fun, like, once I had it down, like, you can just do it, right? So not only did we derive it that way, but I did it backwards, forwards, through another way, through another way, <laughs> through angular resolution yeah. first, through optics first, and I posted it on Twitter. It's like a giant flex, so I don't know. Yeah, and may, <laughs> oh, and may shit, I say uh, thank you, ever thank you for everybody that showed up and supported uh, the server and the live stream and Shane uh, and for what he does. So thank you guys and thank you, Shane. All right, it's a flat Earth. It, I guess we're all done congratulations, here. Congratulations, right, man. I thought congratulations. we'd have questions. <laughs> you guys are just like, yeah, applause is over. Well, Fucking well done, Globe. See ya. <laughs> uh, <laughs> see you awesome, dude. That model is available on your website? Yeah, but we just stole Walter Bisman's model. We took all the stupid explanations off because he said it was mm -hmm. like because heliocentricity, but in the code, 
None of that's true. It all just works from observations, like everything, just like eclipses, just like everything they claim is exclusive, but is not. Right. So this is the whole point of taking this is to be like, okay, someone show me the Java code where uh, the JavaScript where he shows <laughs> anything to do with gravity, uh, mass attracting mass, you know, anything like that. Because he doesn't. Anyway, it's a wonderfully adapted model with the correct description. So if you were to use it, right, it would have the actual explanation for why the things are happening. And to be honest, I wrote like a book to put all those descriptions together. So it's quite in depth. Yeah, you've been trying to get refutations for like two weeks now. Like none exist. So congratulations, it's over. Yeah, I, I guess that's true. I did consult like, like what the, I consider the, the smartest yeah. globers, and they were like, the, ah. the relationship that they said that we couldn't have, like we have it now. It, Dude, like, for real, this, yeah, is, like, so it's, this like, is like real history right here. Like this is it. Yeah. Like I get to oh, wait. I get to be witness from the beginning to the end. From the first second where I was like, Eureka! I think I, I got, got it. <laughs> Coming, yeah, fantastic shane and if anyone everyone. wants to go follow shane go check him out on adl.place uh his like i said you go to adl.place slash shane's <laughs> hyphen fe hyphen model shane's fe model with dashes in between uh, adl.place slash shane's fe model you'll find his the uh you know the program with his description and his description okay. of what's going on and like he said the javascript's not using you know mass attracting mass or anything like that so uh yeah this is been a fantastic explanation of something that we'll continue to talk more and more and more and more and more about because like he said this is our topic and this is just a matter of how perspective works and the more we dig into this shane's taking the math here now you, you know the the math that to me was you know i think a lot of us in order to get here we found it intuitive in the first place the idea that perspective is not so simple and obviously things converge in the distance and now Shane has brought us the math to show this and the way that this relationship would work would not be linear. And like he said, we, it scales uh, into different fields of vision, different sections of vision. So, uh, yeah, fantastic, Shane. 